we are going to today uh, cover a pretty fancy subject uh, called the variational quantum eigensolver. VQE for short. Um, uh, let me cut to the chase and say that uh, the actual mathematics behind VQE is not as hard as the name might suggest. This is not some fancy algorithm like the ones that people use to, let's say, find the um, inverse of a matrix. Uh, this is actually a very simple algorithm uh, on a piece of paper. The difficult part is, of course, implementing this on an actual uh, working quantum computer. And uh, there are not many quantum computers out there in the world that can uh, do this at the moment. But people say that Google, uh, Google's computer, Sycamore computer, can, uh, can do this in some sense. So this is sort of moving away from the realm of pure theory into the realm of reality at the moment. So you might say we are sort of at the critical point in the, in the history, in the, development of the, in the development of the quantum computers, where all of these theoretical ideas that were proposed really decades ago. So in fact, this uh, VQE idea was proposed in a paper by... Uh, Seth Lloyd, uh, some PRL paper around 1999. And uh, I'm not going to give you the exact reference because uh, basically this lecture will cover the essence of his idea uh, completely. And uh, I, can, I can say with confidence that I cover his idea completely because this is a pretty simple idea after all. Okay, so with that introduction, uh, let, me, let me get started. So uh, first of all, a little mathematical warm-up. Uh, suppose I have this kind of state. So again, this is a superposition of all the uh, all the input state. We're having this phase factor, and uh, this is not some random phase factor, in the sense that every phase factor can be written as some power of a a single phase vector. And this power is nothing but the integer which characterizes the uh, input state. Okay, so now the question is, can we find this, uh, this uh, frequency? Can we find lambda through uh, quantum measurement? So that's the question. Okay, and uh, here the trick is again uh, QFT. Um, well, I think uh, general wisdom uh, in mathematics really is what comes into play here. Uh, people in mathematics often succeed by transforming a uh, difficult problem into an equivalent problem, which turns out to be quite a bit easier to solve. Uh, perhaps the same spirit can be said of the following procedure. Sorry. Got 
mixed up. So instead of trying to work directly with this function psi zero, I'm going to work with this uh, transformed function. The transformation being implemented by the uh, QFT, unitary operation. And um, hopefully you recall from the previous lecture that the uh, QFT operation acting on a given basis state is, let me try to recall the precise expression. Yeah, I think this is the price precise expression. Yeah, so this is the definition of a QFT operation. So combine this result and you can write again as a double sum. Uh, let me see. So omega, again, hopefully you recall, is 2 pi i over n. So uh, if you put together everything, then it's i 2 pi over n times y minus lambda multiplied by x and x. Oh, sorry, sorry. Now that you have done the uh, Q of T, this should be Y, not X. That's very important, actually. Okay. Um, so now what next? So I just showed you that after doing a Q of T on the initial state, I find I find this okay so this is what I find and again I can see that this uh, expressions in including X uh, sort of factorizes so I can obviously write uh, in this way. Okay. So whatever this is, this is the phase, this is a factor multiplying this particular uh, input state. Okay, again, once again, this has the form of a, a free series. Okay, which suggests that unless the argument here is zero, or, or at least very, very close to zero, then this uh, sum over all the x values will give us zero. Okay. So the, the, the result of performing this uh, summation will be at least approximately given by n times some sort of delta function, uh, 2 pi over n over y equal to lambda. Okay. And I'm going to write lambda as 2 pi over n times some value y star. And hopefully y star is uh, very close to an integer or even exactly equal to an integer. In that case, I can write this more simply as a chronicle delta function between y and y star, both of whom are integers. Okay. So with that, now I can say that the summation becomes something very simple. There's just one state left over.
Okay. So somehow, uh, out of this uh, initial state, which consists of a whole stack of 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 uh, input state, pops out this a uh, single state. Y star simply by virtue of uh, having performed this uh, QFT transformation. But then what is Y star? Y star is 2 pi over N times, uh, sorry, N lambda over 2, fi, 2 pi according to this formula. Okay, so what what that means is that knowing the value of the y star through a uh, quantum measurement, of course, is the same as knowing the exact value of the lambda. And lambda, remember, was exactly this uh, number that controlled the phase of the wave function. Okay, so one can uh, measure the phase lambda through some measurement and there's not much to measure because if everything goes according to the plan then the the result is just one state so whenever you measure it however you measure it you will only find this state. Okay, there will be no other state to be measured. All right. So uh, it all feels like magic. And uh, I guess that's what's cool about these uh, quantum computer becoming a reality that uh, a lot of the things that we would have thought to be uh, magical on a uh, classic computer suddenly becomes quite routine calculations on a quantum computer. Okay, so that was the mathematical prelim preliminary for uh, what I want to discuss from, uh, from now on. So the, the point I want to discuss from now is to find the eigenstate and the eigenvalue of some quantum Hamiltonian. Okay, well, what's the big deal, you might say? Um, well, the big deal is that if you have uh, many particles, let's say particle one, particle two, particle three, particle four, etc., uh, then actually solving for the exact eigenvalue and the eigenstate of the uh, Hamiltonian becomes uh, exponentially difficult. Well, a simple reason for that is if you have n spins. Uh, pictorially, then the n spin system is will be arranged as something each spin taking on one of the two values 0 and 1, 0 and 1, etc. So that the total dimension of the uh, so called Hilbert space is 2 to the n. So in this uh, Hilbert space, the dimension of the uh, Hamiltonian is uh, 2 to the n by 2 to the n, meaning that the matrix expression of the Hamiltonian is this uh, 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. And uh, then when n is 10, then this is 10,024 by 1,024. That is an easy matrix to diagonalize. However, when, it, when n is 20, then uh, you're talking about solving the problem of 20 interacting spins, then roughly the, uh, 
the matrix size growth to a million by million. And once you reach to this uh, dimension or this number of particles, although 20 particles doesn't seem like a particularly large number, but still diagonalizing a million by million matrix is starting to become a huge challenge because the time it takes to diagonalize a Hamiltonian grows as uh, n to the third power, I think. So um, here n was uh, here n was ten to the three, but here n is ten to the six. So it's a thousand times increase in the matrix dimension, but then the computational time is n to the three, so it's ten to the nine. So it's uh, what a billion times. takes a billion times longer to uh, diagonalize the diagonalize the matrix and I'm laughing because it's not just the problem of uh, diagonalizing time but also the ability to store all the data in the process of diagonalization so what that means is that you need a huge memory uh, memory space to store all the intermediate results and not just the final results and, uh, and also, you want to be able to access those intermediate results to uh, move to the next intermediate results and so on. Uh, so basically, at the level of uh, 20 spins, already you start to hit a roadblock, uh, which is more or less impossible to overcome by any amount of clever tricks and algorithms and uh, assembly of powerful supercomputers simply cannot be done. You know, I mean, if solving this problem is a matter of saving the future of humanity, then probably people, people will do it, but then this is not exactly uh, that level of importance to people probably won't do it by putting so much resource. Uh, so then uh, it is said that sometime, I don't know, maybe in the 70s, uh, Feynman obviously uh, realized the difficulty of numerically solving a Hamiltonian because of this exponential rise in the dimension of the Hilbert space. And um, and it is said that he somehow suggested an alternative to that conundrum by saying that maybe you should uh, build a quantum computer. Let quantum computer solve quantum problems. Uh, this was probably more of a prophecy than an actual prediction. Uh, there's no record of Feynman actually having sit down to produce any concrete uh, theory or formulate a concrete idea for, for all of this. But nevertheless, you know, whatever he says has an influence on future generations. And it is said that this Feynman's remark kind of triggered interest in, uh, in a number of people to think hard about the possibility of a quantum computer. And uh, to what extent this has a connection or influence on Peter Shore is not obvious, but uh, it so happens that Peter Shore was an uh, undergrad student at Caltech, where Feynman was of obviously a uh, you know, big name. And apparently Peter Shore also took some classes in uh, physics, including quantum mechanics. So hopefully, so he definitely knew something about quantum mechanics, even though he was uh, later trained as a mathematician 
And、um, he might have heard a thing or two about、uh, Feynman's idea of a quantum computer. <sighs> you never know where people、uh, get t h i s、uh, crazy new ideas. Okay, so anyway, so now we are much closer to realizing Feynman's dream of、uh, using a quantum computer to solving a quantum problem. So, by solving a quantum problem, I mean simply that given some、uh, quantum Hamiltonian、uh, or given some huge Hermitian matrix, H, I can Find out a whole bunch of eigenstates or eigenvectors and the corresponding eigenvalues.、So、that's it. That's what we mean by solving a quantum problem. So, can we solve the problem provided we have a very powerful, efficient quantum computer at our disposal? And the answer is more or less yes. Okay? And I'm going to tell you why. Again, the idea is to、uh, prepare some initial state as a superposition of all the possible states in the input register, multiply by.、Uh, By some state in the output register. And I put a subscript V to denote that what the output register realizes is a variational state. Okay? So this、uh, variational state is not. Is not some、uh, eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Okay? But、uh, hopefully, the hope is that it's not some random state either. The hope is that this variational state that we kind of imprinted into the output register. Has,、uh, has at least some non zero overlap. Epsilon is some tiny number,、uh, maybe an exponentially small number. And the hope is that this、uh, variational state that we implanted、uh, by more or less wishful thinking on the output register has at least more than an exponentially small overlap. With one of the、uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so I understand that's a pretty loose statement, and one can clearly add much more mathematical rigor to it, but then,、uh, you know, that's exactly not the purpose of this lecture. The purpose is rather to give you a、uh, Rough flavor of what we mean by a variational quantum eigen solver and what people are trying to accomplish by running a VQE algorithm on a working quantum computer. So, I'm going to spare some of these mathematical details, which I'm sure that mathematically oriented people have all figured out already. And simply move on to the next step. Okay? So suppose I have、uh, prepared my initial state in this fashion. And then what I'm going to do next is to obviously、uh, impose some sort of a unitary operation on the initial state. And this unitary operation does the following it acts on the、uh, output state 
with the uh, some unitary matrix called UH raised to the X power. Remember, once again, that X is an integer that goes from 1 all the way up to uh, n minus 1, where n is the dimension of the input Hilbert space. And uh, UH is, is nothing but the uh, time evolution operator for the Hamiltonian whose eigenstates we are trying to solve. And T represents the time uh, that, that it took for the state to evolve. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so why do we do this? Well, it's not that obvious yet, but then you would have to bear with me and just press on. So, yeah, not yet. Okay. So to go to the next step, you need some uh, knowledge of the basics of the quantum mechanics. The basics says that this uh, variational state is always uh, given as an expansion in terms of all the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with some coefficient c k. Now k spans over the spans the entire spectrum of the Hamiltonian. So uh, k can range over a vast array of choices, but that doesn't matter. You can the point is that you can always represent uh, arbitrary variational state as a superposition of the uh, exact eigenstate. And the thing about the exact eigenstate is that if you apply these uh, unitary evolution operator, which we just call the UH, then uh, this operator turns into a simple phase factor. Why? Because this is an eigenstate. And eigenstate has this nice property. Okay, so now using this property, you can now show that uh to the x power acting on the uh, variational state will give minus i lambda, lambda k, tx. Okay? So there, that's a lot of factors to keep track of, but you really need to multiply all three factors to get the correct result. Well, okay, then, uh, now what does that mean? Now what that means, and let me remove most of the uh, detail to make room for some new details. Good. Okay, now according to this expansion in terms of the eigenstates of the uh, Hamiltonian, and let me emphasize that you don't really have to know the eigenstates beforehand in order to make this expansion, because this expansion is taking place in the theoretical space, anyhow, not in the uh, actual physical space. Okay, so this is the outcome after performing this sort of uh, uh, unitary operation on the initial state. 
again, we have a double summation. And I guess you already know what to do next. We switch the order of the summation so that I can perform the X summation first. And whenever I do the X summation, something, uh, you know, something nice happens. And I hope you know that by now. T lambda K to the X power. Uh, that's the phase factor acting on a on this uh, input state X. Okay. Okay. Now, if this state here looks familiar, uh, that's because we we covered precisely this state at the start of this lecture. And what I said at the beginning of this lecture is that if I applied UQFT on this state, then the result is a uh, some special state X star Uh, let me see. Sorry, the details are already slipping away. Sorry. Yeah, okay, now remember. Yeah, so this X star uh, satisfy this property 2 pi x star over n is equal to or at least very very close to t times lambda k obviously that will have has happen only for a select uh, few of these uh, eigenvalues lambda k okay so now let's uh, try to wrap up. Applying a UQFT on the U psi i state now renders the following state, CK. And then the result of this summation can be simply summed up as a chronicle delta function where K equals a, uh, a, a special value of uh, k. Okay, so then the result is look, uh, hopefully if everything works out, is just one eigenstate. Okay, so perhaps I went, went ahead a little too fast for you to absorb all of this in, uh, in comfortable detail. And uh, uh, you might have to read my uh, lecture more carefully to catch up on some missing details. But the idea, but the idea is, is essentially this, okay? So after uh, performing a number of uh, tricks or manipulations or unitary transformations or whatever, the bottom line is that the, uh, there arises this constraint that only a very special state out of all this assortment of uh, initial states will survive. And that state carries a special quantum number uh, and that special quantum number matches the uh, eigenvalue of one of the uh, eigenstates. And as a result, out of the many uh, states that form the linear combination of my variational state, 
only uh, only this state gets selected out, but what gets selected out is uh, nothing but the exact eigenstate. Okay, so the by performing F QFT on the input side, you extract the eigenvalue, the true eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, and what gets imprinted on the output side, sorry, what gets imprinted on the output side, and we didn't try to imprint this particular state by hand, it just happened, is the exact eigenvector of the full quantum antibody Hamiltonian. And, and again, all of this seems to happen by uh, magic because all we did was really just to do a bunch of uh, you know, unitary transformations. And of course, that's the only thing you can do uh, with a quantum computer, right? As I uh, hopefully have emphasized many times, and in the correct fashion is that the entire scheme for a quantum computer is you prepare some initial state and then you apply a whole bunch of unitary transformations to evolve the initial state into some final state and then you make measurement. That's it. That's in some sense all you ever have to do with the quantum computer and depending on how you prepare the initial state and how cleverly these unitary transformations are chosen, you get to perform all kinds of magical mathematical operations uh, with results that normally would take an uh, exponentially long time to get with the classical computer. Okay.